Good afternoon, everyone. I'm TIFF's Industry Director, Kathleen Drum, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the second of three exclusive sessions we have in partnership with The Guardian. A reminder before we start that um, please no photography or video recording is allowed inside the studio. However, this session is being recorded and will be uploaded to our website and our YouTube channel where you'll be able to find it online. Please do feel free to tweet using the hashtags on the screen behind me to keep the conversation going with our online audience. Our focus today is on the duo behind one of the most successful independent film production companies in the history of cinema, working title. Our host today is Peter Bradshaw, who is the influential and highly regarded chief film critic of The Guardian in London, where he has worked for 18 years. He has also published three novels, Lucky Baby Jesus, Dr. Sweet and His Daughter, and Night of Triumph. His short story, Reunion, was published this year in the compendium Best British Short Stories 2017. Multi-talented. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Peter Bradshaw, who will introduce our special guests. Ladies and gentlemen, hello. Thank you to Kathleen for that overwhelming rehearsal of my CV. My goodness, how embarrassing. Um, my name is Peter Bradshaw. I have the uh, honor to be the chief film critic of The Guardian in London. Uh, it is my very great pleasure and thrill and delight to be introducing this ultra-special Guardian TIFF talk. Uh, I'm going to be bringing on stage shortly two people who are basically legends. Um, I hesitate to use an analogy based on superhero franchise movies because they, they, I'm not sure that they like it, but they are basically the Batman and Batman of the British film industry, <laughs> uh, or maybe the world film industry. Twelve Academy Awards, 100 plus substantial feature film credits, six billion dollars in worldwide box office receipts. And it's founded on the idea that if you offer the public movies based on story, character, ideas-driven material, screenplay-driven material, they will be grateful and they will come along. They have given us the cream of the cream of the modern reinvention of the romantic comedy in the form of Notting Hill and Four Weddings and a Funeral. They've given us some of the best work by the Coen brothers, including the Fargo and the Big Lebowski. They've given us Land and Freedom by Ken Loach and so many other things as well. So, ladies and gentlemen, what I want to do right now is to show you, if this is possible, please, a taste of what they have achieved. If we could play the reel, please. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Tim Bevan and Eric Fellner. Uh, gentlemen, welcome, welcome and thrice welcome. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you everyone for coming. What I want to do, incidentally, what I should say is what I'm going to uh, curate, I think, perhaps is the fashionable term, a conversation. Uh, but I want to leave some time at the end, maybe 10 minutes for questions from the audience. Uh, so if you, anything occurs to you, please save it up for the end of the session. Although I should say that what we do want is questions rather than statements. So if somebody has a question for Tim and Eric, that would be amazing. Um, I want to ask you, are you guys regular visitors to Toronto? Do you, do you, do you come here every year? Yeah, we, we're fortunate enough to be invited occasionally. Yes, um, I understand. Yes. When, like all good guests, when we're invited, we show up. Actually, we were just at a function where somebody was saying, I've been coming here for 26 years, and I thought, oh, he's a, he's a junior, basically. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Laundrette was, I think, 30, 31 years ago. Or you came with Laundrette? Yeah. You came well, with Laundrette? Yeah. Amazing. And this is. High? I'm you obviously were, a lot yeah, younger, yeah. I'm a lot you still younger than you. <laughs> you, you were still at prep school then. I was so still I at prep understand. school, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but this is, I mean, rightly or wrongly, people think of Toronto, I know it's vulgar to say yeah. this, but they think of this as the starting gun for yeah. the awards season. Uh, is, it, is it kind of nervous to come here? You're it, thinking, is this, this is our, yeah. these are our runners and riders? Yes, or? no, it's a fabulous festival, it's because it's yeah. a real audience, and, and there are other festivals that are more scary, I think, because ultimately one's playing to real people always in this, and like, 
we had a fantastic screening last night of Victorian Avatar, yeah. didn't we, where you could absolutely feel this was the audience for the film, and that it's like that across all of the different sorts of films that we've done. Yeah. I, th I and think we're you... also quite lucky because our material is usually British. Right. And Canadian aud audiences are very generous towards um, British content. Um, right. So, yeah, we've been very fortunate in the, in the reaction our films have had. But in answer to your question, it's like we see these films, the, the specialist films, as a, you know, it's like a, a, a hurdle race and you have to keep jumping hurdles. Right. And this is, you're right, the first of them. This hurdles. is the first one. Yeah. And do you, when you, when you, do you uh, come to the, uh, the, the first screening and you, do you guys sit at the back or stand yeah, outside in the foyer and watch the people? Or, uh, do yeah, you, can you, of, can you a, relax when you watch movies? There's or? always a bit of adrenaline when you're watching a film. Yeah. The first, with the, you know, in, in its early incarnations with an audience and to see whether they react and if it's a comedy where they laugh, if it's a drama if they're quiet. It's, 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 yeah, it's a, a visceral and somewhat nerve-wracking um, experience and it still is and I guess it, that, that's a good thing. You know, yeah. we, we've been at it a long time but we're, we still get nervous at these things. And do you turn he's, up to the... He's very calm. I'm like Max Bialystok from the... <laughs> <laughs> freaking out at the yeah. back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, actually, I, 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 yeah. As I've, as I've got older, I think there's, there's very little difference between absolute tragedy and absolute victory in actual fact in terms right. of films. Right. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and do you, do you ever they show They both last about the same length. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you turn up to the press conferences as well, or do you, do you leave that to the director and the... the the, the I tend cast. to leave it. I don't know. What, what do you do? Yeah, no, my, my attitude... I mean, this is quite rare. Nobody usually wants to hear what producers yeah. have to say. So <laughs> oh, thank you. Shame. Um, yeah. But, yeah, we tend to leave it to the talent and the directors to do the talking and the writers. Um, and occasionally we'll do a press conference or if, if there's a specific reason for it. But um, I, I think most people... In a visual format, they want to hear from, the, from the talent. They want to hear from the talent, yeah. yes. Uh, I, sorry, what were you going to say? No, no nothing. Was <laughs> I was going to say, uh, just to sort of wind back a little bit, um, I, I have a sort of a mea culpa, really. I, uh, the first movie I ever reviewed professionally was, was one of yours. It was Notting Hill. Okay. Uh, and, uh, no doubt you gave it no stars. I probably gave it a minga. I did, true, to my, I'm if very sorry in the shade. two stars of this man. No, not two well, stars. Yeah. No, no. We have, we have history here. We're, no, sure well, we yeah. we'll, just, we'll just get that out. We'll, you know just, what? we'll just make him squirm we'll, a little we'll, bit. We'll, bit. <laughs> we'll get on to the subject of the hateful <laughs> critics in a minute. It's actually a miracle um, we're still in business. It's a miracle I'm still alive. But I, I'm, I'm sorry and ashamed to say I gave Notting Hill a kind of a, it wasn't a bad review, but it was a kind of minging review, as to use a technical term, uh, an obtuse review. And looking back on it now, uh, I, I sort of see now what I didn't see then, which was that romantic comedy played at that pitch, that level of ingenuity and originality. If I'd have known then what I would now know, there were so many people who were going to try to rip it off, yeah. so many people who were going to try to clone it, and try to do, and as it were, Richard Curtis or Hugh Grant yeah. comedy, I would have been a little bit less ungrateful, I like to think, <laughs> than I was at the time. And the, the scene in it, which has almost become a meme, really, of, I think we saw a bit of it there, is Julia Roberts saying, I'm just a girl, yeah, yeah. standing in front of a boy. I think that's an amazing scene, amazing. actually. And even at the time, I like to think I understood it now. It was an amazing scene. I think it's Julia Roberts' best performance, really, that, that movie. I think, it's, I think it's sort of incredible. I love Notting Hill now. Yeah, I mean, Richard is a remarkable writer, and he, yeah. makes, he makes simple things. He, he, he managed to simplify what people are saying, but actually it's extraordinarily difficult. Yeah. Um, but he does. And, and, yeah, there was a very good run of movies, starting with Four Weddings, and Notting Hill and the, Brid uh, the Bridget movies and Love Actually, which yeah. were absolutely... And Mr. Bean. And Mr. Bean. And uh, uh, that all came from, from Richard and Rowan, and that was very much the sort of springboard for the for working time. The movie I think of, it, it, I would go slightly earlier back to say The, the Tall Guy, yeah. which is a, such a, a funny movie, and uh, incidentally, Emma Thompson's feature film debut, it, it I come to think of it. Yeah. Uh, and amazing and rather moving of watching her in the children act to think of... of uh, Actually, she's, she's, it's funny because I don't think she's done anything with Rowan since then and, and we're doing a Johnny English movie at the moment and they're on the set together. Uh, oh, really? Day, yeah. Um, and it took me back to that, yeah. Yeah, because that's such, such an amazing film. Uh, kind of directed, of course, by the late, great Mel Smith. Yeah. Uh, but that brings me to Four Weddings uh, and rightly or wrongly, we think of... I think of Four Weddings in a Funeral as... <coughs> 
the great sort of years, I mean, obviously, working title had been in business for years before Wolf Four Weddings, but that was the big beginning of everything. And people think of it as a way the beginning of a kind of new British export market to the, to the United States and, and uh, a, a type of movie which, a trope, if you will, which working title kind of invented in some ways. When you look back on that movie, do you think, yes, this is, this is where it all started? What, what uh, well, I think both of us had been making films independently and then together for quite a long time before that. So it was kind of right. good that it took that long to have a film that really worked. So we understood the vagaries of the business and how it can, can, can love you and then hate you, as it were. But I think that what we discovered with Four Weddings and a Funeral was that you could make a, a non-American English language film right. that would find a gigantic audience around the world, and particularly outside of America, actually, is that the, uh, right. al always our figures have been very huge in foreign, before foreign was trendy, as it were, and b b before the market had expanded yeah, expand as, as much thing, as, yeah. as it has. And actually, not only in, in comedy, but then in all, all of our movies, as we, we sort of zoned into that and realised that there was, there was an opportunity to, to, to make English-language films that would work all around the world. I agree. agree. <laughs> <laughs> The, the, the other thing it did, though, was it, uh, it was the first time that we'd had a hit working with a company that had proper distribution. Right. And the interesting thing is, as producers, we, we used to piece our films together with a bit of money here and a bit of money right. there and a pre-sale here and a pre-sale there. And, and, you know, you'd make the films as good as you can. It was almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. They never really blew out. No. And this film, Four Weddings, won the, the, the fact that it was a great film and that it was commercial. But you really got to see how when you had uh, one company distributing it in many territories, right. how they could really push that and generate a lot of extra revenue from it. So it taught us that distribution is a really distribution key, is the, is it's such a key a piece thing. of yeah. the puzzle. And, right. and and we've you know. been very fortunate since then, you know, because that was, that was in the days of Polygram, but then subsequent to Polygram, we've been with Universal. With Universal. Yeah, and yeah. Both, both owners, if you like, have, have allowed us to have a, a lot of creative freedom and choose the films that we want to make, which is what we've, we've fought for. But then we've had this amazing thing of centralised distribution, so that, that when, and when that machine switches on, you, it almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah, and it strikes me, you almost have a relationship with Universal that, as it were... A director might have with, with a studio that yeah. you are uh, that. Well, we've had the good were fortune Stanley with Stanley Kubrick with Warner it, Brothers or whatever. Well, with both they, Universal and Polygram, we had the very good fortune that they ran uh, they run in, in in Universal and they ran in Polygram their foreign uh, operation out of London, right. so that it meant that we were able to we are able to be in all over the campaigns basically and and right. be very much part of the way these films get marketed and the. The, the way the campaigns come together. I mean, Eric's been working crazy hard on both Dark Star and Victoria and Abdul to, to get the campaigns to absolutely as sharp as possible. Is, does that take up all your time? I mean, people say, you know, what does a producer do? Well, this is part of what a producer does. Well, at the end of the yeah. film, that's, yeah. what people, that's what producers yeah. do. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we see the most critical pieces of uh, making the film as, you know, putting it together correctly, you know, developing, getting the right talent attached, getting the right finance distribution, getting all of that set. And then the final half, which is editing, getting the best cut, marketing and distribution. Um, if we've made all the right decisions at the beginning, right. then the actual shooting should go brilliantly. It doesn't always, it's, but, it's, but... But you shouldn't be running interference while you're shooting, because if you look at the, the way the finances work on a film, is when, when you're shooting, is you're spending $200,000 a day. When you're in pre-production and in post-production, you're spending five or $6,000 a day. So you don't want to be running interference when that amount of money's been, yeah. being spent. If, and, but, but you need to have done the, early, the packaging and getting but the script But that's what it's about, right. yes. It's yeah, about totally. laying, the, laying the groundwork, presumably. Yeah, it's but absolutely, you don't... getting the foundations right. And... Uh, from what I know is that it's about uh, hiring the talent and letting them get on with it, presumably. A, that, and then B, what I think we both do is we then watch day. We, you know, we're part of the whole process and all the rest of it, but you watch what they're shooting very, very carefully because it's all too easy when you're on a film set and it starts to rain or somebody's got a toothache for that yes. to take over, basically. Right. And, of course, it doesn't matter at all in the ultimate scheme of things because what goes down on the screen is what matters, and that's right. what we have to absolutely keep our eye on all the time to make sure you're getting the material. And are you watching, I mean, are you sort of, as it were, watching dailies yeah. or something? Mm. Yeah. And now, now that 
they're streamed and all the rest of it. So yeah, yes. that's, you know, you don't have a traditional screening theatre where you can. We do, but we do. <laughs> so you watch them in, on your phone in the bath. So. Oh, I, I, I thought it was like, as it were, David Ozell's next saying, "Stop! Yeah. What the hell is this? This doesn't look good." Yeah. No, we're very lucky. We have fantastic offices with a screening room, with cutting rooms um, on the same floor, so right. we can stream all the rough cuts into the screening room and watch films you know, on a big screen rather than just on a small monitor, right. which a lot of people have to do. So you can really feel how the big screen experience is coming along during the process. But it right. is important to, to say what you think from dailies. And it yeah. is, because it's quite scary, particularly in a... In I a, must be terrible. In, in, in a screening room when everyone's lined up. And I remember on a film that will remain nameless, I was watching dailies one day, and I was absolutely certain that one of the cameras, the, the images were soft, basically. Right. And I thought... Is it me? Am I going yeah. blind? Or you know? And it took me about ten minutes to raise, to be, have the guts to say, yeah. I think this is out of focus. Yeah. And everyone then goes, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh, it's out of focus, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> uh, um, but, but you also have to say if somebody's performance is shit or if this is that or, or, or yeah. whatever. You have to have that. And it's funny because it's, it's a. It's something you have to break down. Yeah, so. exactly. It must be terrifying for the director to be in the room with you guys, it, wasn't it? it? I mean, it's <laughs> so simple and so lovely. <laughs> <laughs> We what? actually, just on that, without being flippant, we, you know, our lifeblood is our directors. And, yeah. you know, we, you, first of all, thank you for such a nice introduction. That was very generous. Well, um, cool. But thank you the, for that. you're so right, it's all about the directors. And mm -hmm. we've been very lucky to work with some of the world's greatest directors on a regular basis. And a lot of what we do is creating an environment for them to be brilliant within. Right. Um, so, no, we try not to be scary or heavy-handed or anything like that. No. It, is, it is about, you know, uh, allowing really talented people to do what they do best. Yeah, because the thing is, the film business per se is nuts because it's like every film you go out to make uh, is like starting a new business. Yeah, particularly you, unless it's a sequel, and you know we we have some sequels, but it is like starting new businesses, and it's all of the challenges of starting new business of marketing and all the rest of it. And the only thing that we can get continuity with is the is the talent that we work with, right? And that mitigates that to a large extent, and particularly the director. So, you know, I mean, the two festivals in the fest, the two movies in the festival are both products of big repeat businesses, five or six movies, six or seven movies that we've made with both Stephen and mm. with Joe. Right, and. Uh, those are, yes, I wanted, to, I wanted to talk about Victoria and Abdul and Darkest Hour in, yeah. in a little while. I wanted to ask you about something that I know you, you've spoken to me about, which is superhero movies and franchise movies. And are they a good thing or a bad thing? Because I, in one of, uh, one of our uh, Socratic email dialogues, Eric, you have raised this subject with me. Um, one of the ones where I went, how the fuck can you review this <laughs> film that bad? <laughs> one, one of those ones. I'm not making stupid superhero <laughs> movies here. Give me some credit. And I, I can't apologize enough for whatever ill-informed review that was about. Um, I'm sure there are many you to choose from. But uh, what, what do we... I mean, uh, that seems to be one of the big discussions for the industry is, is the idea of the temple and superheroes and how it seems to be the case that any actor who wants to get on had better swallow his or her pride and try on the lycra because they're going to be out to, to, to play a superhero. And is it... I mean, maybe the superhero movies are a good thing because they stimulate interest in the industry and this will have a kind of trickle-down effect. Or is it just dumbing us down so much that we are... Uh, our palettes are becoming jaded and we can't see yeah. original, n original material? I mean, do you... Well, Eric what, can't what do you think that. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, is this, a, is this something you... You know, I think it's, um, it's potentially dangerous, but there's nothing wrong with it. If you make a good film, it doesn't matter what it is, Yeah, it should... It has validity in the world, and um, a lot of these films are attracting an audience, so uh, there's an audience for it. Will we make them? No, because we don't own the IP, and we probably don't understand how to make those types of films. But I think there's nothing wrong with them whatsoever. Um, the problem for us is, you know, like we're having it right now in a film we're putting together, what happens is the studios that make these films, they book the actors, and then they get you know, God knows how many sequel options on them. Yeah. And so you can never book a good actor because he's, he has to hold himself yeah. free yeah. for whichever studio it is that might then want to do a sequel to this one or that one yeah, or the yeah, other yeah. one. So it's really difficult in terms of, you know, getting some of the great talent. Yeah, that, I mean, that's really changed in the last five or six years. The, yeah. uh, uh, the, the superhero movies and the, the 
long form mini series, the Netflixes and the Amazons and all the rest of it, right. where, where talent gets booked up for yeah. a massive uh, amount of time. And actually, so all of a sudden you're having to book somebody, you know, here, where are we in September? You're, you know, you're booking their next June or July slot. And yeah. it, it's sort of, it's sort of crazy. And that's, that's, that's changed quite a bit. I hear that particularly Star Wars is a, is Star a huge Wars, all of them. Yeah. All, all of yeah. them. Yeah. All of the DC, the Marvel, the, the, all and of them. And they're the payers, that's the thing. And so you completely yeah, understand it as, yeah. as, as, yeah. As, an, as an actor or whatever. Yeah, so yeah, that, exactly. That, that's must but, so huge. Yeah. But, but I, I think that the, 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 the potential danger, um, which is not pointing fingers anywhere other than at all of us in the industry, is that if the quality of the films and the, uh, the variation of the films isn't maintained, then I think, and we're probably in an area that it's starting to wobble, the audiences will migrate to as they are, to games, to Netflix, to digital. Yeah, and to I, think, I, I agree with that. And I think it goes all the way, you know, it's, it's amazing we're shooting a live action movie in, in Scotland at the moment and a lot of the crew have come off these superhero movies and things like right. that. And they're just so relieved to be out shooting something real rather than yeah. against right. blue screen. Absolutely. So I think that, 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 that yeah. in the DNA yeah. of actually making the film is you're getting this tiredness amongst everybody and I think that is a dangerous thing actually. Yeah, like right. all the studios in, in England are just book solid um, for these huge sequels and you go on the stages and it's just green screen everywhere yeah and a yeah. few props and, uh, yeah, and the, cru real. the crews are getting yeah, yeah. a bit bored of it and so that's they a, love that's, it that's a bad thing and it is yeah, yeah. yeah. an so innovating, on, innovating experience on, on baby driver as well we managed to get an incredible crew because they just they love the idea that we were doing real car chases and yeah, Edgar was yeah. shooting everything for real and they, they hadn't worked like that in years. Yeah. Such, a, such a great movie. I hope everybody's been to see Baby Driver because it's such, such a fun movie. Yeah. Such a great film. Thank you. Um, Five-star five review at five the Five-star review for me. <laughs> I kind of got, I clawed it back from Eric there with a bit. Okay, a bit of crawling, scratching yeah, back. Kind of yeah. back. Yeah. Just a little bit, not entirely. But um, I, I, you mentioned Netflix. Uh, this year, the Cannes Film Festival... Netflix became a big problem uh, that the local French industry got on their high horse, in a way, about Netflix. Uh, and they, they almost pressured the Cannes Film Festival to withdraw Netflix films from the competition because th they didn't have enough of a commitment to the cinema and the cinematic yeah. experience. Um, what do you think about Netflix? I mean, uh, is I think there it's a problem? I mean, I know you guys are interested in TV, and have no, it's a good thing. You know, because in fact, going back to romantic comedies, a lot of romantic comedies get seen on on, on Netflix and all the rest of it. I think the industry is still going through a transition right now, and right. you've got the Netflix and the Amazons and everybody who are the big new players, but you also have the studios who are going to have who are contending with the shortening of windows and all the rest of it. Right. Um, and I think that it's all still chucked up in the air and it'll land and there'll be some new way that the whole the whole distribution thing works which will still involve people going to the cinema and it will also involve people watching the, these things and everything in, the, in their home as well because ultimately that's what the consumer wants to do. I mean, Netflix is only playing to the consumer at the end of the day. Yeah. I don't necessarily have a problem with watching films on a small screen. I'd rather do it on a big screen. Yeah. But when I think of when I first saw great movies, yeah. actually it was on television. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of us, if we're honest, the first time we saw great movies was yeah. on TV. Yeah. I remember when I first saw The Searchers, it was on Saturday night or on a BBC series called Saturday Night at the Movies yeah. after Bruce mm -hmm. Forsyth and the Generation yeah. Game. And it was amazing. It was yeah. an amazing experience. Yeah. And I, I responded to it as cinema. Yeah. I couldn't have told you why, yeah. but I knew that it looked different from a television programme. Yeah. Yeah. But that's another thing I want to ask you, because this is a big theme at TIFF this year is storytelling and the art and craft and science of storytelling. And has that been modified or changed in any way by long-form television? Do you, is the material that you're seeing changed by that at all? I mean, we all speak as if it's very important, but is it just the same thing as, as ever? Or what, what do you think? What, the, the long-form long being long movies? or Well, no, well, I just ten wondered, hours, I suppose. Ten hours. Yeah. Long-form television seems to be making an investment in character and personality. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the idea that you watch it every week and you make an investment and, as it were, the character of yeah. Don Draper yeah. or Tony Soprano enters your bloodstream after yeah. a while. In, in, and that's a luxury that maybe feature yeah. films don't have. Yeah. Do you think it's... Does, does yeah, that I think it's always been down to the quality of screenwriting, to be yeah. quite honest. And if you have a screenwriter like a Richard Curtis or a Lee Hall, or, you know, we're just doing a movie that Bo Willimon's written at the moment, where they are 
full-on character and full-on narrative, and mm. they're great, great technicians at it, then they can do it in 90 to 100 minutes right. and make it very, very satisfying. But it's, it's a very, very, very difficult skill. But I think the, the, the great thing about the long form is what was happening is all the great writers were being sucked up by the studios to do one or two week rewrites on, you know, superhero films. Right. And they weren't actually writing great, great material. No. And now they're able to because they can write all of those wonderful stories. But they're all for, moaning because it's so uh, much work. But they're all yeah. moaning because it's so much work. Yeah. It's huge work. Yeah, that's right. They are moaning. <laughs> it's a lot of work. But yeah. at least they're writing now. Yeah. And that will then yeah. filter back into film and there'll be original films being made and... You know, hopefully it'll all work out. To be quite honest, I don't, it hasn't changed that much. It's, no. it's, it's, it's difficult to find a decent writer. It's difficult to find a decent director. It's quite difficult to get it financed. And it's always been sort of equally, and there's always been different places to go. But ultimately, you know, what, what Richard Curtis actually really taught me was that it's, a, it's all about quality. And it's all about mm -hmm. making whatever you're working on as good as you possibly can right to the last second. And that that's what will deliver to an audience. That's... It's really interesting you say that, the, the, the last second theory, because one of the things that I've, I've slight, I wouldn't say it's a bee in my bonnet, but it's something that I've noticed with movies of whatever sort, whether they're Hollywood studio movies or movies made in Iran for £75,000, is that how few movies have a good ending. How yeah. very You've few. You've got to have yeah. a good ending. Yeah. That loads of movies I see seem to be premises. They seem to be like, I, I've got an idea for a film, and they've got the first act, and it's amazing. Yeah. And then... then I know, I'm consciously or not, I'm using very old-fashioned comments, first act, second act, third yeah, act. Yeah, yeah. But a, by the time a, we get to the third act, I'm thinking, well, what happened to yeah, us? Yeah, there's a direct correlation between the last 10 minutes of a movie and the box office. Yeah. Is there? Yeah. I mean, you For have sure. a great last 10 minutes. People walk out satisfied, walk out, excited. They, great, yes. they can forgive things. You know, if you have a fantastic first 10 and then the rest of it's not very good, you're done. But if you yeah. have a great ending and you've still got them there... The audiences will remember that and talk about that. Mm. But, but it takes time. And, and you know, we're, we're very lucky because we're a mature company and we have a lot in development and all the rest of it. So we don't have to get that film into production because that's the way we get paid. And, you know, quite often these things are taking three, four, five, six, seven years to, to develop to a point where it's worth getting making them as it were that's yeah. and, and that, that a lot of producers don't have that luxury. No. We do because we've been at it for a while and we've got a great depth of development. On that point, can we now, I'd love to play in the trailer for the first movie that Working Title has uh, at TIFF this year, which is Victoria and Abdul. So if we could uh, bring that in now, please. I'm 81 years of age and have almost a billion citizens. I've been in office 62 years, making me the longest serving monarch in history. Have we finished? Abdul, you will travel to England. To the royal household. You will present the Queen with a ceremonial coin. Whatever you do, you must not look at Her Majesty. There's a famine in India. Prime Minister, you really are terribly depressing. Yes. Jenny, Her Majesty. I suddenly feel a great deal better. She has requested Mr. Kareem be her personal footman. How do you like your Scottish costumes? They're very scratchy. Everything in Scotland is scratchy. What can they be talking about? What is a mango? The queen of fruit. I would like a mango. They only grow in India. Well, I'm Empress of India, so I have one cent. No one really knows what it's like to be queen. Mother! You're spying on me. Everyone I've loved has died, and I just go on and on. What is the point? Service, Your Majesty. We are here for a greater purpose. You are a servant no longer. You will teach me Urdu and the Quran. You've upset the order of everything. Drop this Indian peasant, or we will have you certified insane. Treason! <laughs> I am perhaps disagreeably attached to power, but I am anything but insane. I am Queen of England, Empress of India. Abdul has risen on his own merits. Now 
He is my friend. I haven't been as happy as this for years. A little surprise. What is it? A mango, Your Majesty. It's off. Sir Henry, this mango is off. I was just saying, it's, it's very kind of, it's almost moving to see Judy Dench back in that role. I mean, I know that Mrs. Mrs. Brown wasn't a, was a Harvey Weinstein film, I think I'm right in saying, but uh, this is, strikes me as an example of what you're talking about, is that the historical British period movie is something that is so potent, uh, and, and everybody can understand it. It's almost like to our generation, what the, in a way the Western was to an earlier generation, that you could, you could use it as a genre that everybody understands in a way, uh, and everyone can relate to. How, how long were you working on Victoria and Abdul bef- before, it, before it came to the, the it, screen? It, um, we bought the book initially about, I think about five or six years ago, uh-huh. um, and then uh, for one reason or another, we actually didn't go through with developing the project, so we gave it back to the producer and the writer. Um, they then wrote it on their own account and then brought it back to us. It was a, it was a weird, convoluted situation. And then we got back involved. So probably the, the total period was about five or six years, but the, the, the most recent period was probably about two or three, so relatively quick. Um, and you're right, the idea of a landscape that people are familiar with, um, you know, this, is, these, this film or Darkest Hour or, or Mary Queen of Scots or some of these... Uh, the Stephen Hawking film, Theory of Everything, they are our superhero movies. You know, they are, yeah, exactly. In, in yeah. terms of, They've you know, of they, they have IP attached to them where, you know, the, the, their brand awareness and brand um, loyalty in some cases so that we can sell them into the marketplace with some kind of awareness. Um, but we can still make the kind of films that we want to make um, without having to buy incredibly expensive IP that actually isn't even really available. Uh, by IP, just this is intellectual property, yeah, yeah, the yeah. concept of yeah. intellectual property, yeah, that, that it's not, as it were, like buying a YA series of novels yeah. where you have to kind of... Yeah. No, luckily like, they're all in the public domain. No, yeah, it's true. <laughs> I mean, it's like Shakespeare. They, yeah, they, it's exactly. like they're all, well, most they're free. Yeah. I mean, it, it, what must be a part of the, 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 the potency and, and the uh, penetrative power, in a way, of, let's say, for example, Queen Victoria, is that that speaks to... I don't know if it speaks to anybody here. Technically, our present queen is the head of state of Canada, yeah. but, but that's not quite what I mean, is that our current queen... We're talking about Queen Victoria, who's at the very last years or months of her life yeah. and her reign, and this is almost, I hardly dare say it out loud, is what Queen Elizabeth, our own yeah. Queen Elizabeth II is as well. So do you think part of the, the power of this is it does, whether you like it or not, whether you're a Republican or a monarchist, it kind of speaks to your sense of, you know, this, a sense of an ending, almost. Uh, what do you think, Tim? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I actually think it's... W- with these historical uh, pieces, and we have done... It, it is a kind of genre for, for working yeah. title. It's about getting, you know... Uh, Eric's right, there's IP, and in, in that people know who th- these people are, but you've mm. got to make sure there's a, a really good story, piece of narrative story going through it, which is usually about a chunk of their life, but also you've got to make sure there's some real emotional impact. And, you know, um, Judy gives a very emotional um, uh, performance in this film, and that's what the takeaway is, I think. For, I mean, for we, we start with these films, as Tim just said, as is it a good story? Can we get great actors in it? Is there a fantastic director? Do we think people will enjoy it? And then often what happens, the zeitgeist catches up rather than us exploiting the zeitgeist. So, yeah. you know, you've got a, a film like Darkest Hour, which we'll talk about in a minute, which people will want to talk about leadership. And, but we, we didn't know that Brexit was going to happen or a change in, you know, the mood in the world was going to happen. Um, so often they play into the events and then you get asked, oh, are you, what statement are you making? Yeah. Mm. We're not. Yeah. We're just making great stories and hoping that people will go and see right. them. Occasionally we'll make a film that does have a political message. Um, but mm. these two... Oh, hopefully just good films. And I think you don't go at them thinking that it actually started with Elizabeth. We made a movie about Elizabeth 20 20 years ago. And that was a modern 
modern feeling movie yeah. and I think one of the if you talk to Joe Wright is he'll say I never think of, of, of any of these films as being period I just think of, of a, as a great scene that I'm going to shoot basically and they happen to be in period costume and they happen to be in a period set you know and I think that that's taking that sort of contemporary approach to it is really important because that's what uh, an audience will, will, will cotton on to. The great thing I thought of Elizabeth is that it's such a complex dissection of court politics. Yeah. It's a kind of movie that you have to, you can't let it wash over you, you have to yeah. sit on the edge of your seat to make sure you understand what's going on. Yeah. Uh, and the, the negotiations with Francis Walsingham and or yeah. Elizabeth I, I love it because it is about mm. power yeah. and about, and it's, it's not something, it's not a, a period movie that you can wash, let wash all over you, you have to make sure you understand what's going on no, because it's, it's a like water playing chess. A movie, it was, it, was, it was let's make the Godfather set in Tudor exactly. Space yeah, exactly. Exactly. This it is really a, good news because Darkest Hour is a bit like that, so he's going to love it. He's going to love it. Gonna, he's a five so, star. Yeah. <laughs> it's a five star. Make sure you I'm, look yeah. at the Guardian <laughs> yeah, review yeah, yeah. tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I was, uh, do you know what? I was going to ask about, I mean, uh, I, what do you think about reviews? I mean, I, I, I very rarely do uh, Q&As like this without the director kind of turning on me at one stage. Uh, we would never I mentioned uh, La- I mentioned Ken Loach's Land and Freedom. Well, we, no, did, we didn't do that. Do that. One. Yeah, we we did. Uh, he did. What, we did. did uh, hidden agenda. What was it called? Hidden, hidden agenda. agenda. Hidden Agenda. Oh, yeah. okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. I did. I. I you got the got Ken. With Ken Loach, and Ken Loach sort of spent more or less of the time giving me a pretty good bollocking about the Guardian's <laughs> failure to support socialism in all its forms. And yeah. so I had to sort of. We, I've had that I'm lecture. awfully sorry, Ken. <laughs> Failure to support Jeremy Corbyn, which he thought, and he's, he's so I, I, I. We'd like to say the critics don't really matter, but but they do, and we spend a lot of time uh, reading them and worrying about them and all all the rest of it. I think it is, uh, it's. But it's an unholy I mean, alliance. I, it is an unholy <laughs> alliance. I mean, We're I looking it. forward to making a movie with you yeah. so yeah. that you can experience So I can experience, well, I know, I, yes, I can experience. What it's like when the darts come in. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can't, there are, I, I, it is, but by the time you finish the movie, it is a bit like one of your children because you've spent so much time, tender, loving, care and attention and it, it may, just like one of your children, not be very good. Um, but, you don't, you, you, but, but, but you don't. But you don't want to be told you don't about want to be it. Told, yeah. <laughs> but do you think? That, but is it? Uh, I mean, do you, when you if you if you get a good review or a bad review, do you think? Uh, can you separate in your mind? You think, well, that's good but because it's, it's the Guardian. Yeah. We can. I, I only. I think to be fair, I only ever yeah. write to you when I truly believe in the film and can't understand. Yeah. How you could have seen it in a different way. No. But, you know, we sometimes make films that aren't very good. And yeah. well, so I you expect s- yeah. not very good reviews. I sometimes write reviews which are wrong. So, yeah. you know, I d- <laughs> hardly dare admit well, it to you. But, uh, <laughs> but what, the other thing... But you gonna... never set out to make a bad movie. Is no. The truth of it is, but it can happen anywhere in the foundation. And, and also, you, sadly, you work just as hard on a bad movie as you do on a good movie. Yeah. And so that, that's, that's, that's the thing. And, right. you know, we, we always having made the decision to make a movie, we want to make it as good as we possibly can. And it right. may be that there's something in the foundation that means you're building the Leaning Tower of Pisa, but it doesn't mean you work any less hard. That's, I've got another question I want to ask about this, but I think what I'd like to do is to play in Darkest Hour at this stage. Okay, Could we play in the, the trailer, please, for, um, <clears throat> for Darkest Hour? We must now select my successor, and it's only one man the opposition will accept. He stands for one thing, and one thing only, himself. Why have I been forced to send for Cheshire? This record is a catastrophe. Let me see your true qualities, your lack of vanity. Yeah, my eye and will. Your sense of humor. Ho, ho, ho. Your Majesty. It is my duty to invite you to take up the position of Prime Minister of this United Kingdom. I speak to you for the first time as Prime Minister. The Germans have encircled 60 British and French divisions. We are looking at the collapse of Western Europe within the next few days. How long have they got if we don't rescue them? Maybe two days. We would need a miracle to get our men out. You have the full weight of the world on your shoulders. We're facing certain defeat on land, the annihilation of our army, and imminent invasion. We must negotiate peace talks. When will the lesson be learned? You cannot reason with a tiger when your head is in its mouth! Nonsense. The only slippery slope... Would you stop interrupting me while I am interrupting you?
We have before us many, many long months of struggle and suffering. Even though many old and famous states have fallen into the grip of the Nazi rule, we shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. For without victory, there can be no survival. See, I think Churchill is another character, another quasi-Shakespearean character like Queen Victoria, who's a, an IP kind of... Uh, He's an IP, IP kind, kind of guy. Of, uh, an asset, <laughs> yeah. And what do you think... I mean, it's, it's kind of... Again, it's kind of moving to see Sid Vicious become Winston Churchill. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing thought. Maybe it's not that much of a leap, actually. Maybe there is elements of Sid Vicious. In that was Winston both Churchill. Gary and my first movie, um, Sid and Nancy. Okay, yeah. So we go, and we do laugh about it a lot, the idea that he's gone from Sid to I still kind of can't believe Winston, it, actually. When I, yeah. when I see him, maybe it just dates me. Yeah. I just think, I cannot think of... of, of um, of, of him as anything other than Sid Vicious, or maybe yeah. Joe Walton. I mean, the, yeah. The, the, yeah. it seems to be sort of amazing, but that just dates me. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about Brexit and about does Brexit colour the way we see these things now? Do you think Brexit, a kind of little Englandism, has infected our country and we, don't, we, we have to see it in a different way now? Or, or, or what, what do you think? I mean, I was going to ask you whether you think Brexit hurts the business, quite aside from these... <laughs> Who knows, but I think, grand... the, I think the politics of the last two years have just altered things so fundamentally that that it's going to find its way into our film culture somehow. I'm not quite, and, but we're only at the edge of that, yeah. I think. Um, and, and who knows how it does mm. that. But I mean, I, on, on a technical basis, yes, it'll hurt, because it'll be harder to move actors and crew, you know, backwards right, and yeah. forwards. It'll be a nightmare to move material, you know, cameras and equipment without carnets and God knows what. So, yeah, on the technical side, it'll be a pain. Um, and as Tim says, whether it'll start flowing into the way stories are told, we'll see. I mean, British cinema has done so well out in the last decade because of, we have such a healthy tax credit. Like, in fact, Canada's got a brilliant tax credit for visual effects, but we have a brilliant production tax credit. And how that's all going to sit in amongst it all? That, will that necessarily change? I mean, maybe. Uh, pr probably not. But we, you know, but you go onto a film crew, and there are people from all over Europe working on it. And if we read what was leaked in the Guardian and interpret it correctly, yeah, then yeah, th that's yeah. not going to be the case yeah. in 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 uh, two years' time. Yeah. yeah. So, it seems mad, but yeah. we're yeah. not politicians. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You rise above it. Exactly. Um, ladies and gentlemen, what I'd like to do now is to invite some questions from the audience. If anybody have, and if you could um, wait, please, until the, um, the, 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 uh, the, the microphone is with you. I think there's somebody right here. Yes, please. Hi. Um, short statement. I was at the screening of uh, Laundrette. Um, however many years ago. I think it was my, my first or second TIFF. Um, and to see that film, and you guys are a part of the explosion of British cinema with Mike Lee and Hanif Karishi and Stephen Frears and all of that, and just congratulations. And then I saw Darkest Hour yesterday at the PNI screening, so great to, that you're continuing that. A question, though, you're running a what's really a mini-major production company. How much time do you get to spend actually on the films? You're running the company, but then you're making these fantastic films. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, uh, all the time is spent on the films. Um, that's what we do. Um, the, um, you know, the company is actually very small, and each film then becomes huge. So all of our employees predominantly are employed on individual projects. So and Tim and I run films separately so we can do more. Um, and um, it's all about the movies. Everything is about the movies. Well, one of the reasons we went with Polygram in the first place and then with Universal is that we, we had been independents and we spent no time on the movies because you were running around trying to organise distribution and the money and all the rest of it. And we realised, both of us realised that actually 
the films weren't very good, and you needed to, we needed to spend the time on the on making sure the creative side of the films was absolutely on, and that's yeah. what we so both when, when the, doing. So when the finance and the distribution are locked, and also we've you know we've done sixty something films with the team at Universal at the moment. And it's just brilliant. You know exactly who to talk to in Croatia or Germany or America or about this issue. Or, so everything works seamlessly and beautifully, which allows Tim and I to focus on helping get the films as good as possible. That answer the question. Um, I just wanted to ask you how you choose the scripts. All of your films, I've been lucky enough to see uh, just about all of them. Um, how do you choose the scripts? to have such beautifully complex, drawn, passionate women in them. <laughs> is that a wonderful coincidence, or are you actually making a choice? We have a fantastic development department and that, that's worked with us for many years. It's made up of fantastic women, in actual fact. Um, on the, I don't, oh, there's, actually, the, whole, the whole company is virtually made up yeah. of women, so the humanity of everything we do is because of them, not Tim or I. Yeah. Uh, but we do, uh, joking aside, is, is that getting the script right and then getting the cut right is the most important creative thing that we can do because everything, everything flows from the, from the screenplay and one has to be very disciplined and you have to allow it to take time, basically, and it takes a lot of time. Uh, yes. I think... Hi. Um, my question is very simple. How can we have more diversity in British films, particularly with regards to the narratives? Um, Britain is changing fundamentally today. It's very different Britain. How can we make films that are a bit more representative? Well, we have a very solid answer for you because we agree. Um, we're actually, Tim's been driving it, but we're starting a sixth form college school in the UK for up to a thousand students. And we are trying to ensure that we get an absolutely diverse set of students and the school is predominantly to teach filmmaking and screen, uh, you know, all form of screen um, activities. And so we're trying to start right at the bottom to try and educate people, get people from ethnic backgrounds into diverse backgrounds, into the industry. Because and to make them realize that it's a possibility. Yeah, so make it, them realize it's a possibility, there's an opportunity, just, yeah. there's, 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 and then hope that their voices will multiply yeah. exactly what you're talking about. Because we couldn't agree more. And, uh, you know, when we go to Pinewood or to the studios, and the fact is that they're not diverse, and that's yeah. not, not right. We don't have an answer for a quick fix, but that's what no, we have. No, but it, we realised that you had to go back and start at, at an education level, and then it, that will go through the system. And as one gets older, one realises that actually happens quite quickly. Yes. Hi there, my name is Siobhan McCarthy. Thank you so much for your body of work over the years. You're just an amazing power team. And to that, I'm curious, how do you work... Um, how do you come to consensus amongst the two of you? He, he does everything I say. <laughs> <laughs> or is the, it, might, it might actually be the other way around, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's... it's um, we kind of know what each other, each of us likes. And I was actually just thinking today, so it's getting much more mixed up than it used to be, is that um, because we're work, we used to be quite clear about who we work with in terms of creative relationships and all the rest of it, but actually it's all into a big pot and everyone's working with everybody in it. it I think what you do is you have, is you, you're, you kind of think what will he think a little bit in the back of your mind about certain decisions, and I think that dictates them, which is a, is a good thing, it's a, it's, a, it's a discipline. It's a quality thing. I never actually asked you how you two met. Was there a kind of meet cute that we should know about? I mean, was <laughs> no, I, I remember. I think I remember the first time. It's because we were, we both ran music video companies, and for some reason, I, I, you had your company was called Fugitive, wasn't it? Was it no, it was, no, was called. It? Um... What was the very first one called? I can't remember. But all I remember was that there were a lot of very skinny and very, believe it or not, hairy people, basically. <laughs> and Eric had an afro of hair at that point, and a, and, and a big grin. And I thought, oh, that, that's a very nice man. Um, 
And then we were in parallel through the 80s. We were both making music videos. Eric made Sid and Nancy. I did The Laundrette. And, da, 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 and then we came together. Right. Uh, yes, I think we have another question over here. Initial. Initial. That was it. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, I'm a writer from Armenia, and I have a question. It's one of the basic ones, but I'm just wondering how you pick up new talents uh, in the film industry and new writers. Uh, I'm sure that this question you got a hundred of times, but just interesting. Our team are very, uh, are very good at working with and reading and, and knowing about new talent. I mean, and that whenever we develop a, a script, we tend to go out to a number of different writers and we'll go out to all sorts of different people and there'll be less, less experienced as well, as well as more experienced people on that, that list. And, you know, I think the thing is, is it's a creative company and if we don't invest in youth and new ideas and all the rest of it, then it, it will die, basically. So all along, we've always had to make sure there's new creative talent coming into the business. And if you, I mean, we gave uh, Edgar Wright his first film, Joe Wright his first film, um, Stephen Frears, Stephen Daldry, um, Sharon Maguire. Um, uh, We're really old. Many others. <laughs> you know, Gary Oldman, um, Kate Blanchett. Um, yeah. I mean, there's Emma so Thompson. Many, Emma Thompson. Emma Thompson. There's so many people that we've, we love it when we find new talent and can work with them and then watch them explode. It's, been, it's very satisfying, very exciting. Another thing, do you watch short films and do you, do you check out the sort of BAFTA winning short films and say, wow, this, this Personally this person not, but is... there, there are people in who, who, right. who do, very much yeah. do in, 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 in working title. I, so. I watch the occasional one, but... I just wondered, cool. with, you know, the big question, is it worth making a short film? The answer mm. is yes. Yeah, I think it, it is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, if a, if a short film bubbles up, then it definitely comes to the attention of our development department and then we meet the, the director or the writer attached to it. Right, right. Uh, yes, we have one more. Um, I'm a huge fan. Uh, Tim, I sent you a package back in 1993. Sorry, I haven't got around to it. Yeah, that's, <laughs> it's okay, it's never was, too late to you know, read it. talking about it in the green room. He even must get around to it, yeah. It's on his desk. <laughs> yeah, it really is. <laughs> it, it's printed out, it's an actual script. I oh, okay. It's not a yeah, USB yeah, key. Yeah. Um, I have a question about your relationship with the Coen brothers, because you talk so much about British cinema, and obviously the Coen brothers aren't British, so That's how did that come about, question. and what, you know, and especially the Big Lebowski, because I'm curious about how that all developed, because I know mm -hmm. the film was panned when it came out, and then it's become such a cult classic and a huge inspiration for me. Yeah. Um, it, um, uh, it actually came about because of Ken Loach, weirdly. Um, we were making a film with Ken, who refuses to hire movie stars, and um, the financiers at the time were a company called Hem Hemdale. Hemdale. Hemdale, and they said, we'll only give you the money if uh, you have a movie star in it, and um, uh, Francis McDormand had just been in the film Mississippi Burning, and uh, sent her the script, she really liked it, Hemdale really liked her, said they'd pay for the movie if she was in it, and Ken Loach wasn't keen because she was a movie star. So we sent him to um, Hollywood to meet her, and I remember, this tells you everything you need to know about Ken, sent him business <laughs> class, and he came back and he said, you know, I was really upset that you sent me business class, and I was like, oh, God, we couldn't, <laughs> we couldn't afford first class, and he goes, I fly economy. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, <laughs> anyway, I've got an anecdote about that. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> so um, he comes back, da da da. Cut to um, she's in the movie, and just before she's about to sign a contract, she goes, "You know what? I haven't seen my husband for ages. Uh, he's been making this film called Barton Fink. I can't do the movie. Got to stay in New York." So we said, "Okay, what if we give you as a seven-week shoot? We'll give you seven Concord tickets because Concord was still operating then. You can go home Friday evening, and the money basically was coming out of." our fee. It was just like, how the hell are we going to make this happen? And um, she agreed to it. And instead of her going home Friday night, coming back Sunday evening, Joel Cohen came to London every weekend. Um, and we became firm friends. And then Tim and I got close with Ethan and, and Joel as well. And it went from there. And we've had a fantastic relationship working with them for, I think we've done eight or nine movies with them. It's been brilliant. But that's how weird things happen in our business. It's kind of fun. Um, I just wondered, I have a two-part question actually. The first one is, what do you think of merchant ivory films? 
And the second part is, how do I pitch you? Um, I love merchant ivory movies. And they were very much part of our culture through the 70s and 80s. Yeah. And there were some fantastic films. I remember... The, Room of, where, yeah, Room of Views with Daniel was in that, wasn't he? So he, he was did, indeed. He, he played Cecil Weiss in that, He yeah. did it at the same time as uh, my, my beautiful Laundrette mm. um, and came out of both of them. 85, yeah. yeah. So but they were, they were in, you know, they had a really important imprint for many years in, in, uh, in British cinema. Uh, and they, they preceded us in many ways. They were making slightly more traditional movies, but they were finding a pretty big audience, those, those, uh, those films. Um, and you pitch us through our... Well, you, you, you send all your scripts to peter.bradshaw at <laughs> theguardian.com. <laughs> and I sort of say, and if it's four stars he, or above, I hand it on to them. He will give us an early look at the review. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we'll then determine whether we're going to make it or not. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. I'd be delighted. It would be an honor. I would be like the Kenneth Tynan of my day. It would be amazing. It would be amazing. Okay, I think we've got time for one or two more. I, we, we sort of, oh, we are really close on the, on, the, on, the, on the edge now, but yes, one more. Are there any directors you haven't worked with yet whom you would like to? I'm sure there are plenty of directors that we would mm. like to. Number work. one on the bucket list. Hmm? Number one Number on the one. bucket list. The director you want to work with. Oh. Um... It's a diplomatically difficult question to answer. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, actually. It's, it's, uh, it's probably, yeah. It's probably somebody who's still at film school or something like that, to be quite honest. Very diplomatic. That's very diplomatic. <laughs> um, Do we have one more? Just one more? Yes. Hi there, thank you for coming. Uh, this is really insightful, and I love all the films that you guys have done. So, although we were talking about all these successes, I want to hear some failures. I want to hear some... I want to hear, like, horror stories of stuff that has happened to you, too, and it's like oh, crap, this can't happen, or, oh, crap, like, something's gone wrong. We don't tend to discuss this in public. Do we? No. <laughs> it's always good to happen. It, ha it happens every day, yeah, though. Yeah. I mean, literally, you know, because we have an L.A. office, so every morning you wake up, emails come in, and there's a moment like that. Yeah. But I'm sure all of you, who any of you are in the industry making yeah. films, you have the same yeah, thing. Producing is a non-stop uh, event of trying to steal a little bit of victory from the jaws of disaster. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I think that is a very appropriate moment to end on. Yes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming, and please give another to Mr. Tim Fevin and Eric Fellner.